Churches of Christ present Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. My name is Bobby Baker. I'm from the Twin City Church of Christ in West Helena, Arkansas. Glad to have you with us at this time as we study the Bible. We'll be looking into 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the nature of the gospel of Christ. We'd like to encourage you to look up at one of the churches of Christ that will be listed at the end of this program, who sponsor this program. And if you have any questions, please call upon them. They'd be glad to give you that Bible answer. And please, if you have any question about what is said, please search them out. As we look at the word gospel, many of us know that the gospel means good news. And it means glad tidings or a joyful message. Wherever you find the words of the New Testament, it means that good news of some kind. For those who look for good news, they can find it in Jesus Christ. But we must always determine the nature of that good news from the context that we read. In the context, the writer affirms that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ constitutes three great fundamental facts of the gospel of Christ. But what good news is there about the death of Christ or about the death of anyone, as far as we might think? The good news of Christ's death is that He died for our sins. That which we know about the gospel comes to us, and what I'm going to refer to, in threes. The, good, the gospel deals with many great things. It deals, first of all, with the three divine persons. For we recognize very easily, if you open your Bibles to Genesis 1 or to John 1, you recognize God there in those passages. In John 3 and verse 16, a verse that many people will recite, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All we can really know about God is found in what we refer to as the Word of God, that is, the Bible. And this is the Word which by the Gospel was preached unto you, 1 Peter 1 and verse 25. We know about Christ as that divine person as well. Now, I know some deny Him in some form. They want to call Him a created being, or they want to call Him one that was born after the fact, whatever it is. They want to make Him a little God. But when you read John 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. That is Jesus Christ. And yet, in Matthew 16 and verse 16, we find there, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, 
the Son of the living God. So let those who preach the gospel to be sure to preach Christ and not ourselves. In 2 Corinthians 4 and in verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Another part of that Godhead is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was that which helped the early church and gave it the, the Word of God which had been given to Him that the truth could be taught. In John 15 and in verse 26, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall, notice, testify of me. The Holy Spirit revealed the Word in John 14 and verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Spirit confirms the Word of God as well. In John 16 and verse 13, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, He shall, be, he shall speak, and He will show you things to come. Notice the work of the Holy Spirit in that passage. First of all, He was told that He will not speak of Himself, but He will speak of that which He hears. That which He would hear from the Father, He would give unto those apostles, which we have by inspiration in the written form of the Bible today. So when you read that Bible, you have the Spirit of God in that Bible, in that Word, and you should be hearing the Word of God so carefully. Also, the gospel deals with three great dispensations. We know of the patriarchal dispensation. In it, in that age, the gospel was preached in promise. As Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3 remind us, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. It is through Abraham that down through that lineage we come to Jesus Christ. And yet the Jewish or Mosaic dispensation came after that patriarchal. And in that age, the gospel was preached in prophecy. Prophecies such as Isaiah 2, verses 2 and 3. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and in the house of God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And then the third dispensation that we deal with here is the age of the, uh, of the gospel, that it is preached, that is the Christian dispensation. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, there the Lord said, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Notice, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. We also deal with the three, uh, three relationships of man. There is man's duty to God. Now, some people may not think of it that way, but listen to Matthew 6 and verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. To seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness means to give God the priority that is due Him. That means we place Him first in our life. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 18 confirms that as well. We must seek Him. In other words, when it is time to come together to worship, we seek God first, not our worldly wants or the things we want to do in the world. Many people will say, well, I've worked hard all week. I deserve Sunday off. And I've heard others say, well, I was out in my fishing boat, but I remembered the Lord at, at, on that Sunday morning. I, I uh, read a scripture and and I uh, carried my own Lord's Supper with me. Well, that is just not the same. We seek Him out first. We seek His ways. 
We seek to do those things that belong to Him. And when we do, we will be added unto Him. And yet, God must be first in the Christian's life. Matthew 22, 37. We must place Him first. That is, He is first in our giving. He is first that comes to thought in our actions and what we do. And one cannot separate God from the kingdom or the church uh, or Christ from His kingdom. In the Christian age, Christ is king and the church is His kingdom. I speak to people on, on a number of occasions and they'll ask me the question, are you ready for the kingdom to come? Are you seeing the signs of the kingdom to come? Well, He said there would be no signs to begin with. But understand, I am in His kingdom now. When I obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, I was added into the church, which is His kingdom. When He comes, He's coming to take me home. He's coming to say unto me after judgment, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. In to seek first the kingdom and His righteousness means to love God with all of one's heart, with all of one's soul, and want to keep His commandments, and to live His life according to the things which He has commanded us to do. Now, when one does this, the spiritual part of man will grow spiritually. As we grow spiritually, we will change in so many ways. We will begin to do those things after we learn them. That is, we will do those things which is pleasing to God. When one puts God first in his life, God will take care of the physical needs of man. Now, I don't mean, that means we sit down and say, God, I need a new car, or God, I need this, and he's going to take care of it. He is going to be there to help us along the way. He is going to give us our needs and not our wants. The Christian has nothing to worry about if we put our trust and in that relationship of putting him first in our life. Secondly, there is man's duty to his fellow man. In Matthew 7 and verse 12, it says clearly, Therefore, all things whatsoever you, you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This verse teaches us to treat others basically as we would want to be treated. That means very simply that if I want to be treated nice, then I treat other people nice. If I come at them with a, a grouchy attitude and a mean, mean spirit in me, then when they return that to me, I should not be surprised. But this verse teaches me to treat others the way I would want to be treated. And it also teaches me to treat others as Christ would want me to treat them as well. And one uh, one duty toward our fellow man is to serve. In Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28, there Christ is speaking and He says, But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. So therefore, we are to serve. Therefore, we should seek to help others. Another duty of our fellow, to our fellow man is to be the right kind of example. In Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, there in those following the Beatitudes and on through the sermon, it says very clearly, Ye are the salt of the earth, but of the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all them that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see, notice, your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. These verses are teaching us very clearly of some things that we are to do. We are to be people who have a substance about us, that we are to be worth something, not like we're supposed to be like that salt that, that enriches things. But if we are not doing what we want to, then our salt is good for nothing, we might say. And also, we are to be like that city that is set on a hill. In other words, if you were going through a countryside and all of a sudden saw a city on a hillside, it stands out to you. There's something about it that draws you to it. And let our light shine. And when we let our, let sh our light shine as Christians, and doing the things that God would have us to do, then therefore we will bring glory unto Him. Then there is man's duty to himself. In Romans the 14th chapter and in verse 12, So then every one of us should give account of himself to God. Let us remember that Christians shall not spend 
should not spend their time judging one another because at the great day of judgment, each one is going to give an account of himself to God. Now, to stand before God is one thing. But could you imagine God saying, Hey, give, tell me why, just to use the idea, why did you do this? Tell me why you refused this. Tell me why you did this. Now, that's just a human aspect of it. I'm not saying that will be the case. But we're going to have to give an account to Him is the point. We're going to answer for the things we did that were not in line with what He has taught us. Or we're going to give answer for the things we did not do from the things that we have in His Word. Everyone is responsible for what He does. Oftentimes, we want to blame other people. We want to say, well, they made me do it. No, they may have done it, but we made the choice to do it. Well, they pressured me to do it. Well, we still made the choice to do it regardless. And what, what does that say? And, and what does he think uh, about his people when we give in to things like that? And one day, all people will give that account to God. And in view of this, Christians should not judge one another. The gospel deals with three great facts to be believed. First of all, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach to you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. First of all, in this verse, the fact to be believed is that the death of Christ. Many men have died for noble purposes. Many men have died for some great cause, we might say. But Christ died for our sins in verse 3 of that context of 1 Corinthians 15. And this explains the purpose of the death of Jesus. He died for our sins. Such verses as John 3, 5 and Galatians 1, 4 remind us of that. But Jesus Christ was the sacrifice for the sins of the world, which God accepted so that He could forgive man of his sins. It was the only sacrifice that could be given. The second fact to be believed here is the burial of Christ. In verse 4, He was buried. Now the burial of Jesus is mentioned in order to demonstrate to us the genuineness of both the death and the resurrection. It is there in the Bible that it clearly says that he was buried, that he was sealed in the tomb, and that there was a watch even placed over it to confirm his death. We also know that God raised him from the dead according to Romans 1 and verse 4. And the third thing here is the resurrection of Christ. He rose again the third day there in verse 4. He was raised on the third day as the Scripture said he would. You can go back to Jonah 1 and verse 17 to Matthew 12 and verse 40, Hosea 6 and verse 2. And as Jesus was predicted, so in Matthew 20 and verse 19, Mark 10 and verse 34, Luke 9, 22, Luke 13, 32, Luke 18, 33, Luke 24, 7, and Luke 24, 46. All these speak of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we must believe those facts. Without believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then why do we even believe in Jesus at all? Some say, well, I just want to be blessed. Well, there's more to it than that. One of the greatest proofs that Jesus is the Son of God is that very fact that He predicted His death and that also that He would rise on the third day after He was put to death. It came to pass just as He said it would be. On that third day, we know some went to the tomb and found it open. We know angels stood by and said, Why are you here? And what are you seeking? And they were seeking for Jesus. And later on, Jesus revealed himself not only to the apostles, but unto others as well. Many have died and have been buried, but only Christ has arisen. You can go to many places in this world, and many will say, This is where the man is buried who gave us the principles by which we live. Well, I can take, they say, well, show me the man that you follow. I can't take you to a tomb. I can't show you the place where he is buried because he is risen from the dead. And yet, to die no more, therefore, 
Death have no more dominion over him, Romans 6 and verse 9. By his resurrection from the dead, we have hope of life after death. You and I should have that hope. Now, some people believe that we would just die and we're dead, and that's it. There's nothing more. But yet, to the Christian, there is that hope of that resurrection. Please listen to 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercies have begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The gospel deals with three great commandments to be obeyed. Number one is faith. In Hebrews 11 and verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. The only way a person may please God is having a faith in Him. And what I mean by that, this is not just a faith in a God or a belief in something, but a faith in the one who is the true and living God. This is not a faith that is just put on for a while. It is believing the faith that it is the God who created the world, who gave man his word, which tells man that God, what God is like and what God expects from those who will obey him. Faith in God necessarily means to believe in him, to trust in him, and, and as he will reward those who seek after him and obey his will. We need to understand that a man may do some things that are um, contained in the Word of God without knowing it like a, a love, the loving of a family. However, but it is not well pleasing to God unless he does it in a, a good conscience, uh, in submission to the will of God. God will reward those who seek him. Another fact that must be believed here is repentance. Repentance is so important. In Luke 13 and 3, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then there is baptism. Mark 16 and verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And there are many other commandments of the Lord, but these are the ones that we need to remember at this time. And then the gospel deals with some great promises as well. There is the remission of sins. And Acts 2 and verse 38 tells us, Then Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Sinners have always needed to believe, to repent, and to obey God's will. In the Christian age, there is a new act to obey, and that is baptism. And Jesus had commanded the apostles in the Great Commission to go and preach the gospel. He started that basic condition of which they went forth in Mark 16 and verse 16 when he said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. <clears throat> so therefore, those who believe will follow through and will obey the gospel of Christ. Now some will reject Mark 16 and verse 16, but you know it is not in conflict with Matthew 28 and it is not in conflict with Acts 2 and other passages about baptism and what it does. And yet, Peter preached this, and, and he told the purpose of baptism. There is another gift, and that is of the Holy Spirit there. The gift of the Holy Spirit must be distinguished from the gift of the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit were the miraculous powers in which were given to those people in that day, where they could perform those miracles to help to confirm the Word of God. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift of the Spirit Himself that is given to all believers who are baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 5 and verse 32. We could say it is the indwelling of the Spirit, which is dealt with in detail in Romans chapter 8. And then there is the gift of eternal life. To go back to a verse that all know well, John 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Obedience is, is the primary command of the gospel. 
Do I want to obey my Lord? Do I want to obey my God? Do I want to do the things that He would have me to do? That's what it really comes down to. And then the gospel deals with other great motives, such as the fear of punishment. And in Matthew 16, 16, it says it so well, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That is a certain fear that we should have, that we would be separated from God. There is the hope of eternal reward, as John 14 and verse 1 through 3 teaches. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. My Father's house in this passage refers to heaven, and therefore mansions literally means a place to stay. When he says, in my Father's house are many mansions, he's simply saying there is a place in heaven that is prepared for you to stay. And the only way that we can do that is if we are faithful unto God. The love of God and the love of goodness of God is there. In Romans 2 and verse 4, or, or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So therefore, if we will follow God and we will come into the kingdom of grace, as John 3 verses 3 through 5 teaches, being born again, not uh, being born of the Spirit, then we will do those things that are necessary. We will receive the Word of God. If you have any questions about that which has been said during this program, I urge you once again to look up the names of those that will be listed at the end of this program. Call upon them that they may come and talk to you about what the Bible says concerning your salvation. Your salvation is important. May God bless you and thank you. If you have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of two free books, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ, and Basic Bible Lessons, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online. Speaking the Truth in Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ.